Okay, let's get started. Thanks for coming, everybody. And we have a bunch of people online too, so thanks to all of you as well. Um, so we have great presenters today. Tim Yerabai is from Ohio State University, where she's the uh, Provost Early Career Scholar in the Sociology Department, which means that this year she's a postdoc, and next year she starts as an assistant professor in sociology. And uh, by way of background, she has a BA in political science from the University of Pennsylvania, and her PhD is in sociology from Brown University. Um, just a reminder, the talk will be about a half hour to 35 minutes. Um, feel free to interrupt with clarifications, but for, for larger questions, try to hold until the end. And we should have about 15 to 20 minutes for discussion. We'll go till about 12.50, and I'll cut us off then. Uh, for free exactly because there's stuff happening after that where the postdocs and um, pre doctoral colleagues can, can take some time and meet with Dr. Abai, and then we want to be sure they have that time. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Abai. Thank you so much for that um, really kind introduction. Um, yeah, my name is Shinira Abai, and really looking forward to sharing some of my ongoing work with y'all. This is kind of work that I'm actively working on. So really looking forward to getting y'all's um, feedback and comments and questions during the Q&A. So the title of this talk is Location, 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 the Housing Benefits of the 1944 GI Bill and the Racialized Stratification of Home Ownership Across the Place. So this work is part of a larger project about the home loan guarantee of the 1944 GI Bill and its effects on racial inequality in a variety of domains, including um, its effects on home ownership and home value, um, kind of residents and home ownership in suburbs or cities, and the intergenerational kind of wealth accumulation as a result of this policy. So today I focus on a set of questions concerning the extent to which the Home Loan Guarantee of the 1944 GI Bill contributed to racial inequality in uh, home ownership across metropolitan status, and then thinking about how this varied by region. So here are just a few more recent um, news articles highlighting the persistence of residential segregation and um, its kind of various deleterious effects. So the Time article reads, segregation has gotten worse, not better, and it's fueling the wealth gap between Black and white Americans. And the PBS News article highlights how segregation and the disinvestment in communities of color that it facilitates um, is linked to toxic water in Benton Harbor, Michigan, not too far from here, actually. This is just a map of uh, residential segregation in counties across the US, and it's just demonstrating how um, high levels of segregation, which are the deeper purple, are scattered pretty um, evenly throughout the U.S. and uh, clustered kind of much more in the in the Northeast, but generally throughout. So there's not necessarily one region where this is the case. So this persistent residential segregation is a problem for many reasons, including the fact that homes located in uh, Black segregated neighborhoods of color are consistently appraised for less than homes in other neighborhoods with similar amenities. And home value is the largest asset that American families possess, if they have any at all. Uh, so you can see here that home equity comprises about a third of the assets that American families own. So work by uh, Joe Labriola and others demonstrates that this inequality in housing wealth makes significant contributions to the large black white wealth gap. And you can see here that white households hold about 10 times the wealth of black households. So this is in 2016, uh, the wealth that white households held was nearly $150,000 and then black households held about $13,000. So there's a well-established literature examining the patterns of residential segregation after the passage of the Fair Housing Act of 1968. And two of the most common models of this racialized residential sorting in the literature are spatial assimilation and place stratification, which I'll discuss in more detail in future slides. Um, and there are fewer empirical works, however, that elucidate how policy may have contributed to this persistent pattern of black and white households living in different parts of the metropolitan area. 
So in this work, I take the case of the housing benefits of the 1944 GI Bill and ask a few questions. So the broader theoretical question is, to what extent has policy contributed to the place stratification and or spatial assimilation models of residential segregation? And then empirically, I asked to what extent did the Home Loan Guarantee of the 1944 GI Bill or the HLG contribute to existing racial inequality in home ownership across metropolitan status? And then how did this vary by region? So why should we be interested in this nearly 80 year old policy? And why is it a good case to understand how policy may have contributed to racial inequality in home ownership across metropolitan status? So first, the Home Loan Guarantee is one of the largest housing policies in US history, costing the US government nearly $20 billion in 1956 dollars. Um, but we actually don't know much about its effects on racial inequality over time. Second, the HLG occurred at a pivotal moment in home ownership because there had been a housing, a housing shortage during the Great Depression. And then after the Great Depression during World War II, much of the kind of resources and energy and effort that would have been directed towards building more homes was directed toward the war effort. So the HLG helped facilitate a massive takeoff in home ownership and suburbanization in the US. Third, the policy relied on appraisal standards that incentivized lending in white suburban areas, um, despite including no exclusionary language in the text of the actual policy. And finally, the impacts of this mid-century uh, policy are still relevant because of the intergenerational transmission of context. So children who grow up in disadvantaged neighborhoods often live in similar kinds of neighborhoods as adults. And children often remain in similar position in the wealth distribution as their parents did. So just to provide some background on this policy, the purpose of the, 1940, the broader 1944 GI Bill was to ease the transition back into civilian life uh, for the veterans re returning from World War II. So benefits included tuition and stipend at the, at the veterans school of choice or fees covered for on the job training. It also included unemployment compensation and health care for injured veterans at no cost. Um, in addition, it included these US Treasury backed housing business and farm loans. So the focus of my work is the uh, these housing benefits or the HLP. So the Home Loan Guarantee was one of many benefits of the 1944 GI Bill, as I just mentioned, and it ensured up to 50% of a veteran's home loan, uh, so long as it did not exceed around $2,000. And for reference, median home value in 1940 was about $2,900. So the HLG was available to veterans who served at least 90 days between September of 1940 and July of 1947. And they cannot have been dishonorably discharged and veterans could receive the, the benefits through 1956. So by June of 1956, four and a half million home loans had been guaranteed, totaling about $20 billion. And the HLG helped 42% of veterans become homeowners, while just 34% of non-veterans of similar ages owned homes. So for decades, the GI Bill was hailed as a triumph of public policy. Um, in a campaign speech in June of 1992, then Governor Bill Clinton called the Peace Corps and the GI Bill, quote, two of the best ideas this country has ever had. And a Senate joint resolution marking the 50th anniversary of the law in 1994 called the Home Loan Guarantee an unqualified success. So the Home Loan Guarantee helped millions of World War II veterans become homeowners, but historians argue that there was significant racial inequality in the implementation of this policy. Um, so this allowed Black veterans to receive just a tiny fraction of the, of the um, benefits to which they were entitled to and that they also risked their lives for. Uh, but the data that um, historians have relied on so far have a few shortcomings, including um, being anecdotal or based on a small scale survey or being region specific. So in related work to try to get a better understanding of racial inequality and in the implementation of the law, um, I rely on Veterans Administration um, administrative data. 
uh, from the Department of Veterans Affairs to estimate racial inequality in the distribution of the policy and then compare this to racial representation in the military. So this is a descriptive figure where I plot the percent of loans insured under the home loan guarantee by race, by race compared to uh, racial representation in the military. So why turn this green, gray, I guess, here on the screen, sorry. <laughs> um, and black men are in uh, lavender. And so, um, <laughs> You can see that although whites comprised about 87% of the military, they received 94% of HLG loans. Um, <coughs> meanwhile, Black men were about 11% of the military and received just 5% of HLG loans. Um, so we can see that although the HLG made homeownership more accessible to um, many millions of, of veterans, it was white veterans who disproportionately benefited from the policies. And this figure is also descriptive and it illustrates the extent of regional variation in the HLG distribution uh, across metropolitan areas sampled in the 1950s census of housing. So the figure maps the ratio of uh, the percent of VA-backed loans granted to whites in these metropolitan areas uh, divided by the percent of white veterans represented in the metro area that year. And so in places where the HLG was distributed equally, the <coughs> ratio is equal to about, about one. In places where whites are overrepresented, the ratio is larger than one. Um, in places where whites are underrepresented, the ratio is less than one. So um, you can see here that um, so, so, so more like deeper blue is more racial inequality in the distribution. Um, and so the map indicates that whites are overrepresented in most, uh, um, the vast majority of metropolitan areas throughout the US, because they're all kind of this deeper blue, which you hopefully you can see there. Um, and this is particularly bad in New Orleans down here where uh, white uh, veterans received about 21% more than the, than the representation at, in, as veterans in the area. And conversely, the only metro area where whites were not overrepresented uh, was in Pittsburgh, which is right there, um, where they're essentially equally, rep the, their, representation, their representation among VA loan recipients is about equal to their representation of uh, veterans in the area. So these are these are just kind of uh, descriptive maps to show that their whites were consistently overrepresented, kind of generally in metro areas throughout the throughout the nation. So we've seen that there was significant racial inequality in the distribution of the housing benefits of the 1944 GI Bill, but why might we expect the policy to be linked to homeownership in different parts of the metropolitan area for different races? <laughs> So it's possible that the HLG resulted in greater racial inequality in homeownership across metropolitan status, which is living in cities or suburbs, uh, because while the policy itself includes no racially discriminatory language, it relied on these racist appraisal standards um, to help determine which veterans would receive the benefit or not. And these appraisal standards were set forth by the Federal Housing Administration 1938 Underwriting Manual. And uh, the manual prohibited racial integration of neighborhoods, and it also equated kind of black residents in particular with higher risk of mortgage default. In addition, the HLG offered the Veterans Administration as a kind of mortgage co-signer. However, veterans were responsible for first securing a loan from a bank. So this posed a significant hurdle for black veterans in particular because of widespread um, exclusion of black applicants from credit markets. So uh, even though there was no kind of explicitly exclusionary language included in the HLG, it operated in this uh, real estate market that was broadly hostile to Black applicants. So the set of federal appraisal standards incentivized banks to lend to white borrowers seeking to live primarily in uh, white suburban areas and disincentivized accepting the applications of uh, non-white applicants and those seeking to live in urban areas. So theories of residential segregation uh, or residential location and different uh, of different racial and ethnic groups is a very kind of well trodden area in sociology. 
And it gives rise to different hypotheses concerning the potential impact of the HLG on racial inequality in urban and suburban home ownership for Black and white people. So the spatial assimilation model posits that the primary reason for segregation of between different racial and ethnic groups is group differences in financial resources. So this implies that as financial resources converge with whites, then segregation would also decline. And uh, this has been found to be a common model for Black and Latinx households. So because the HLG increases the resources available to purchase a home for uh, recipients, uh, though unequally across race, as we've seen earlier, my first hypothesis is that the policy contributes to spatial assimilation among recipients. So then the place stratification model of residential location states that uh, discrimination in the housing market constrains the housing options available primarily to Black families. And this leads to my second hypothesis, which posits that the HLG contributed to increased place stratification because of discrimination at different levels of policy, of, at different levels of policy implementation and in the broader housing market more broadly. So these two hypotheses so far are kind of competing. And it's important to understand the sources of segregation because it's persistent um, and associated with an array of negative outcomes. And um, new kind of findings from John Logan and others um, finds that the largest increases in black white segregation between 1940 and 1970 actually occurred between cities and suburbs. And segregation is problematic for many reasons, but um, importantly, because it allows for the hoarding of crucial resources in primarily white neighborhoods. So resources like high quality, uh, well-performing schools and health promoting resources such as uh, medical clinics and grocery stores and recreational facilities, as well as investments from financial institutions are kind of disproportionately located in white neighborhoods. Uh, there's also significant regional variation in patterns of residential segregation. So during the past 50 years or so, segregation has been the largest or the highest in the uh, Midwest and Northeast and lower in the South and West. And the largest declines in residential segregation have occurred in Western states. <clears throat> and the West has long been a site for a Black housing opportunity. So in a 1913 issue of the Crisis magazine, uh, W.E.B. Du Bois states that the Black residents of LA are without doubt the most beautifully housed group of colored people in the United States. So one reason given for the more favorable conditions in the housing market for Black households in Western states is the relatively small Black population in this region. So um, excellent work kind of argues that the small black population in the West has allowed for uh, white racist preferences for a small number of black neighbors to coexist with uh, black preferences for more highly resourced neighborhoods in this region. So I hypothesize then that the policy may simultaneous, simultaneously contribute to spatial assimilation in the West and place stratification or kind of residents in different parts of the metropolitan area in the Northeast, Midwest, and South. So the body of work interrogating more macro level uh, black white residential segre segregation between cities and suburbs is pretty extensive. And the body of work that examines how mid century policy contribute contributed to um, kind of more micro level segregation is uh, smaller, but still substantial. And both literaturists, I would argue, leave important questions unanswered. So for example, this large body of work that examines residential location or re residential segregation across cities and suburbs um, in the period since the passage of the Fair Housing Act of 1968 is quite large. And um, the focus on the, the post-1968 period is very um, reasonable because like an important <laughs> underlying assumption in many of these studies is that of course there was extreme segregation you know, under Jim Crow in the United States. And so my question is not whether there was kind of um, black white segregation across metropolitan status in this area, but to what extent did forces such as policy contribute to it in the pre-1968 period. 
So a second body of work uh, by Jacob Faber and others interrogates the role of mid-century policy on within city uh, residential segregation um, or micro level segregation between uh, it, within the city across neighborhoods. And this work looks specifically at the effects of the homeowners loan corporation grading on micro, this micro level segregation. But one question that's um, unanswered in this literature is to what extent did a different policy that increased financial resources to purchase a home contribute to this across place uh, macro level segregation rather than micro level segregation. And then finally, there's a large and extensive body of work that focuses on racial inequality in residential location, but uh, fewer studies that focus on specifically uh, home ownership in addition to residential uh, location with important, uh, very important exceptions. For example, Alvin Logan in 92 find that the majority of black home ownership occurred in cities and the majority of white home ownership up to that time occurred in suburbs. So I'm interested specifically in the ways that policy has contributed to home ownership as well as kind of residential location. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm interested in home ownership because of its impl implications for the wealth gap that I mentioned earlier. So as a reminder, the broader um, theoretical question is, to what extent has policy contributed to the place stratification and or spatial assimilation models of residential segregation? And to what extent do the HLG contribute to existing racial inequality in home ownership uh, across metro status? And how did this vary by region? And so uh, for the data, I use the 1% sample of the full count decennial, decennial census through IPUMS. And the sample is restricted to men ages 18 to 65 by the end of World War II in 1945. So I restrict the sample in this way because <laughs> beneficiaries of the Home Loan Guarantee were overwhelmingly male. And the Selective Training and Service Act of 1940 stipulated that all men aged 18 to 65 registered to potentially serve in the war. And I use 1960 data because veterans could benefit from the policy between 1944 and 1956. So the 1966 sample includes kind of the final returning soldiers who took advantage of the policy. And I shook the sample to black and white men because of the relatively small sample of other groups. So the outcome variables are individual level probability of owning a home in a suburb and separately the probability of owning a home in the city. So the independent variable of interest is veteran status, which will serve as a proxy for receiving the HLG. And I use this proxy because I observe whether an individual is a veteran and of which conflict in the census data, but I don't observe whether an individual actually received home loan guarantee by 1960. But hopefully work by um, Trent and uh, David will help me with this problem soon. <laughs> um, so this leads to conservative estimates of the effect of the policy because those veterans who didn't receive the HLG will dilute some of the effects that we'll observe. And then I control for several individual level characteristics, including income, education, marital status, um, and then more broadly kind of the percent of people in the state living in suburbs. And I also include state fixed effects. So in this analysis, I use two stage least squares using an instrumental variable and present estimates at the aggregate national level as well as at the regional level to understand the extent to which this policy may have contributed to spatial assimilation or and uh, place stratification among the recipients of the policy. So the uh, two stage least squares with an instrumental variable is preferable to OLS or logistic regression, I would argue, um, because this, uh, this two-stage least squares allows for uh, controlling of selection into veteran status. And I'll, des I'll describe more kind of uh, the ways that veterans were selected in coming slides. And the second benefit of this approach is that estimates are causal if the assumptions are met. And happy to discuss more uh, of those assumptions during Q&A if people are interested. So um, I use 1960 veteran status as the proxy for receiving the HLG. Um, and this proxy leads to kind of more conservative estimates as I mentioned earlier. And then concerning the issue of selection into veteran status. So nearly two thirds of World War II veterans were conscripted into the military. 
but despite the use of this kind of um, lottery system to determine which men would serve, uh, matriculation into the military was actually not random because recruits were required to pass tests of physical ability and cognitive capacity in order to be admitted into the ranks. So because soldiers were selected in this way, more straightforward um, OLS or logistic progression models um, may produce kind of biased and inconsistent estimates of the effect of uh, veteran status, which is a proxy for receiving the HLG on the outcomes. Uh, and so this analytic strategy is intended to account for that. So the IV analysis in this, uh, or the IV in this analysis is the uh, birth year window. And the IV is a binary variable that's assigned a one if veterans were born between 1917 and 1927 and a zero otherwise. And I choose this birth window because these cohorts had the highest percentage of World War II veterans. And in 1960, these men were between 33 and 43 years old. So this just um, plots the percent of World War II veterans who were born in each birth cohort between 1900 and 1930. Uh, so you can see that uh, 1922 right here has the highest percent of uh, World War II veterans, but that the period between uh, 1917 and 1927 has a generally pretty high percentage of uh, World War II veterans. So if the policy contributes to a decline in, in racial inequality in suburban and or urban homeownership, this is interpreted as uh, the HLG contributing to spatial assimilation. So uh, black and white veterans living in more similar kinds of places in the metropolitan area. So either uh, both living in more, both groups becoming more likely to live in cities or suburbs. And then if the policy contributes to an increase in racial inequality in urban and or suburban homeownership, then this is kind of understood as the policy contributing to place stratification. So I'm going to present the results in terms of both absolute and relative racial inequality um, in homeownership in, in cities or suburbs to give us a more holistic kind of understanding of uh, the levels of inequality. And so relative inequality measures racial inequality in homeownership across metropolitan status in terms of kind of uh, relative advantage and disadvantage. And it's operationalized as the black over white ratio. And then the absolute differences in homeownership are represented as the uh, white minus black difference in homeownership in either cities or suburbs. So I'll discuss both. So, this figure is going to present racial inequality in suburban and then urban homeownership among veterans by 1960, based on the IV estimates that I briefly described earlier. And all other covariates are held within means in these figures. So I compare results with uh, veterans from veterans and non-veterans to try to get an understanding of uh, the extent to which this policy contributed to these inequalities or not. So if we first take uh, the racial inequality in suburban homeownership here, um, white men are in orange and then black men are in uh, that navy. And so you can see here that white men are significantly more likely to own homes among both veterans and non-veterans. And this is of course more true among uh, veterans here. So you can see that uh, that's also kind of very expected from the literature. Um, and so the predicted probability of suburban homeownership among white non-veterans is just 32%. And uh, for the predicted probability of suburban homeownership for white veterans, about 45%. Um, for black non-veterans, um, the predicted probability of suburban homeownership is 8% relative to 12% uh, among black veterans. Um, so if we look at racial inequality among veterans and non-veterans, we see that in terms of absolute inequality or the white black uh, difference in predicted probability of suburban homeownership, it's the largest among veterans at 33 percentage points. So this difference here relative to, uh, for non-veterans, the absolute racial inequality is much smaller at about 25 percentage points. 
Um, meanwhile, the relative racial inequality or the black white ratio is essentially the same for non veterans and veterans at about 0 0.24 and 0 0.27, um, respectively. So uh, we see kind of a different but then similar kind of pattern for um, urban home ownership. So here we can see that uh, black men in this case are the ones who are more likely in both groups to be urban homeowners. And then this is all the more true among black veterans. So uh, the policy contributed to a significant increase in home ownership for black men, increasing from about 24% uh, among black non-veterans. I can get this to uh, yeah, about 24% here to about 35% among uh, Black veterans. So in terms of racial inequality, we can see that the policy contributed to an increase in both absolute and relative racial inequality. Uh, um, uh, per, if you compare the absolute and relative racial inequality between non-veterans and veterans in, suburb, in urban homeownership this time. So these results indicate that at the kind of broader national level, policy contributed to increased um, home ownership for both groups, but more so in different places. Um, so in different parts of the metro area. So these national estimates then indicate that the policy is contributing to place stratification at the national level. So now I'm going to uh, look at the effects of the policy on racial inequality in uh, so suburban home ownership first, and then we'll look at urban separately. Um, so let's look first at the suburban home ownership. So across regions, uh, suburban home ownership is highest among whites. You can see in every region, uh, white home ownership is uh, generally much higher, and this is um, all more true among veterans. And so uh, suburban home ownership is the largest in the Northeast and West at a predicted probability of about 50% for white veterans in both places. And then uh, lowest in the South among non, or, yeah, among non veterans at 24% here among white veterans or white, uh, the white sample. And so the HLG contributed to increased suburban home ownership among white veterans in all regions relative to white non-veterans. And these increases are all statistically significant. And for black veterans, um, there's no real impact except the West has kind of a marginally statistically significant increase for black, uh, for black veterans relative to black non-veterans at uh, P less than 0 0.1. So really on the margins there. Um, in terms of racial inequality in the Midwest, Northeast, and South, the HLG contributed to either um, increased absolute racial inequality in suburban home ownership or relative racial inequality or both. And so this suggests that the policy is further solidifying place stratification in these regions between black and white households. Uh, but the West is the only region where both the absolute and relative racial inequality um, among veterans is lower than it is among non-veterans. Um, so this suggests that the HLG is contributing to increased spatial assimilation or, or residence in more similar parts of the metro area among the recipients of the policy. So in sum, these results indicate that the policy is kind of simultaneously contributing to place stratification and spatial assimilation, but in different regions. So um, place stratification in uh, the Midwest, Northeast, and South, and then spatial assimilation in the West. Yes. Do you have the same plot for urban ownership? Yeah, it's <coughs> right. It's uh, if I can get the slides to advance right here, right. So uh, yeah, so now looking at um, the effects of the policy on urban home ownership, thank you. Um, so the regional patterns of urban home ownership are similar to the national ones. So in almost every region, um, black men are more likely to own homes in urban areas than white men. Um, and this is all the more true for, for veterans overall. So urban home ownership is the highest among black veterans in the Midwest here um, at around 43% and lowest among uh, white veterans in the Northeast at 
So where is it? Yeah, right here. Um, so the HLG contributed to increased urban home ownership for whites in the Midwest and Southwest, or in the Midwest and South. And the Midwest is actually the only region where the HLG actually contributes to increased urban home ownership for Black veterans um, in a way that's um, statistically significant. And so the Midwest, though, is kind of the region with the highest percent of uh, Black residents. So this is actually a huge number of people. Um, and in terms of inequality, the HLG contributes to increased um, relative racial inequality or absolute racial inequality in urban homeownership or both in all of the regions. And the largest increase in absolute racial inequality occurred in the Midwest, where the difference is 13 percentage points between black and white veterans, there it is right, right here, um, relative to just two percentage points um, in terms of absolute inequality among uh, non-veterans. So these results indicate that if we look at uh, only the effects on urban home ownership, then the policy contributed to place stratification across regions. So just to summarize all of these <laughs> figures, um, the uh, results indicate that the policy contributed to increased home ownership for black and white veterans kind of in general, um, but it did so in, in different regions. So um, the HLG contributed to place stratification at the national level and the greatest increases um, in suburban home ownership occurred for white men, while the greatest increases for urban home ownership occurred for black men. And there's no effect on black suburban home ownership for, uh, or, or for black men. Um, however, there's kind of this marginally statistically significant um, increase in the West. Um, and the increase in white urban home ownership is a fraction of the increase in black urban home ownership and nationally and across the region. And so um, we kind of see some evidence for spatial assimilation in the West and the policy contributing to place stratification in the other regions. But what exactly is happening in the West? I mean, it's the only place where there's um, any kind of where the, the racial inequality among not among non-veterans is or among veterans is larger than it or smaller than it is among non-veterans. So uh, to try to kind of get a handle on this and start thinking about this question. Um, I kind of plot select descriptive statistics um, of black men by region. <clears throat> Um, so Western states were not the most popular destinations for Black veterans fleeing the kind of racial brutality of the South, and just 8% of the sample uh, of Black men is living in the West in the sample. So it's possible that the Black men who make it all the way to the West might be selected in some way, potentially in a way that helps them better navigate this uh, housing market that's broadly hostile to Black applicants. So um, here are just a few kind of descriptive statistics of Black men in the, in the region. So uh, the lavender is the percent of suburban homeowners. The kind of gray is the percent of World War II veterans. That kind of more purple blue is the percent of migrants. <laughs> then lime green is the percent of children, college educated, married, and uh, the percent with above median income. Um, so from this, Figure, there is some indication that the share of migrants among Black men living in the West is much larger than in other regions, um, which you can see from the blue bar there. And um, there's some indication that they are also more or less likely to have children, which you can see from the khaki bar relative to the other regions. But these were just kind of some initial kind of um, thoughts about what exactly is happening in the West and I'm kind of actively thinking about this question um, so I continue to work on, on this. So you might be thinking, okay, well, this um, policy was enacted between 1944 and 1956 and the analysis ends in 1960. So why should we still be concerning ourselves with this in 2022? So I would just say that um, segregation between different kinds of places persists today, as I mentioned earlier. And children who grow up in disadvantaged neighborhoods, um, as children often live in similar kinds of places as adults. And this was not so long ago, actually. So many people in this room have parents or grandparents or were themselves alive uh, between 1944 and 1956. And segregation also devalues the homes in Black neighborhoods. 
which negatively impacts kind of black wealth and contributes to the large black white wealth gap that we <clears throat> discussed earlier. And uh, the concentration of health promoting resources in white places contributes to the kind of higher levels of COVID-19 mortality in uh, especially black segregated neighborhoods during this ongoing pandemic. So um, I see this work as making a couple of contributions. So theoretically, it inserts the role of historic policy into our understanding of the roots of residential segregation between places. And empirically, it's the first, to my knowledge, to interrogate the role of the Home Loan Guarantee of the 1944 GI Bill and uh, its effects on racial inequality and home ownership across cities and suburbs. So here's some questions that I'm kind of actively working on. So what's driving the results in the West, as we kind of discussed earlier, is it selection? Is it generally more favorable housing market conditions in Western states? Um, and at what point in the process of gaining access to the Home Loan Guarantee uh, did Black veterans encounter discrimination? Um, are they even deterred from applying in the first place because of racial violence and fears about racial violence? Um, are they denied when they try to get a mortgage from the bank? Or were they able to get the mortgages but then denied when they kind of try to have the Veterans Administration um, secure the loan? So, this work is actively ongoing. So if anybody is interested in collaborating, let me know. <laughs> um, thank you so much. I look forward to the uh, questions and comments. Yeah, thank you. 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 What is the real mechanism? Because suppose the Western states were growing really fast and then they were building all the houses after highway construction and all that. Then unlike uh, Northeastern states where you know all, already cities were built up, so maybe there are stronger racial covenants or there may be some filtering process where kind of rich households are now willing to move in a sort of like new housing sort of that was just built in the suburbs. So urban areas became more open to another group. Like let's, let's say that may explain why like ownership, home ownership was much higher in urban areas in non-Western states. Whereas in Western states, I don't know, like for different mechanisms, there may be no filtering where rich households who are living in the city center are now wanting to move out of the city urban areas. So do you have some sort of a, you know, that kind of like, what is the sort of a period that the city built up area was sort of established across regions? And, and... Yes, thank you so much for this question. I, yeah, I, I'm planning to do something where I kind of think about individual states, because right now, like Western states who, you know, that's Wyoming, you know, in California. <laughs> so uh, kind of totally different things happening in those areas. So so right now I'm thinking of taking like a particular metro area, like the Los Angeles metro area or something, and trying to disentangle like how well developed was the city in general, you know, was it? Because yeah, the Northeastern cities are much more developed in terms of um, kind of the built environment <laughs> and also uh, their kind of uh, racial order. So the West is it's called the Wild West for a reason, you know. So it's kind of a new frontier. You know, people are moving out there for any number of you know more opportunity. And so yeah, the racial order and also yeah, just the built the built environment are not so set. So it kind of may allow for more, uh, as you said, for more kind of opportunity and in, in general for Black applicants in the housing market. So yeah, I'm I'm planning to break this down um, by state at the very least. And I think it might be a bit more difficult to do a metro area, but yeah, to try to disaggregate what is happening and maybe do a comparison between, you know, a state in the, uh, in the West, like California versus New York or something and try to think about, you know, what exactly is happening there. And as I mentioned also the, the percent of um, black people in the sample living in the, in the West is so small. So just thinking about, you know, how that plays into um, kind of racial attitudes in the area and how, uh, you know, there's kind of these theories of um, group threat, et cetera. So, you know, if there's a smaller percent of um, Black people in the area, it feels like for the kind of broader white majority, there's less reason to have like really strict um, 
race order. But yeah, those, these are questions that I'm trying to think about in terms of, um, yeah, the, the, the West just being kind of less developed in a lot of ways than the uh, Northeast, Northeast and Midwest. Um, but I feel like I saw you first. Yes, you, thank you. Okay, um, oh, thank you. Um, so I think I, when I looked at all your results, it seemed to be completely um, consistent with the story of white flight from urban areas, where, you know, like you might think that a lot of people in urban areas, they really wanted to move out because, you know, to get to the suburbs, but like these white veterans, they got this, you know, extra credits and they were able to move out. And that sort of drives ownership in the suburban areas and also leaves uh, ownership opportunities open for 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 blacks in, in, in the uh, urban areas, and I'm wondering if you could, do you have any data on sort of migration rates by veteran status? I don't know if that exists anywhere. Yeah. Huh, I think I could definitely do something thinking about yeah, what kind of the percent of veterans over well, the decennial census might be a bit tough, but I I like this idea of thinking about like. It, more broadly, what are the rates of, of kind of white movement into the suburbs? But of course, that's totally entangled up with the policy because that's where a lot of the new housing was being built because, you know, cities are kind of already packed. And so then as they're trying to remedy this uh, housing shortage after World War II, the suburban areas were the place where there was the most space to be building huge, you know, divisions. And of course, those were in a lot of times um, restricted by of course, racial covenants, et cetera, redlining. So, um, yeah, no, thank you for this idea, though, to think about, you know, the extent of uh, white my veteran migration versus uh, non-veteran migration. I feel like, yeah, okay, thank you. Yes. Um, this is kind of reframing or building on what Sun asked earlier, but I just wonder about the rate of suburbanization overall. So not, not, intermingled with things like infrastructure or things like that, but just the rate of suburbanization in each MSA um, over this time, because I do wonder if that plays into it, because we do think of like post-war years of suburbanization and, you know, the Eastern Seaboard and then in the Rust Belt, but like, I personally don't think about post-war suburbanization of the West until like, well after the post four years. So I do wonder if that's part of it, where it's just like there wasn't as much mm -hmm. suburb um, because the rate of expansion into the suburbs hadn't kind of reached its peak yet in those, in, by 1960. So I feel like that probably something that could just like population change within the MSA or even the size of the MSA itself, because they, they do expand over time. Um, could help tease that out and could be like a normalizing variable almost. Yeah, yeah, thank you. And then thinking about how, yeah, there's maybe a higher rate of suburbanization in different regions at different years and trying to kind of integrate that into the. Thank you. I feel like I saw you. Yeah. I have a question and a comment. So I guess I'll start with my comment is that I think this is um, super, really interesting. And the results you had about the regional differentiation really got me thinking about though Midwest and West as those were the destination regions for great migration. And I started thinking about in terms of migration studies, how you know uh, people are motivated to move to places that they may have uh, family linked and community ties. And so I was just thinking about what that what that also has to do with home ownership and people being able to live and move there. Um, and that and then my question and perhaps i might have missed this in one of your slides but um kind of how you conceptualize the suburban urban divide since those concepts were given rise during those times so i guess this is something from my own research as well but how do you conceptualize suburban versus urban yeah thank you so much for these uh comments and questions so in terms of the suburban versus urban divide i did think about how you know the, does this and does the measure? So the measure that I used from IPUMS is the, um, the metropolitan status measure, which indicates, uh, you know, residents within the city, with residents outside of the city, but within the metro area, residents outside the metro area, and then I think another catch-all category. So that's the um, measure that I used. And so that for suburban, I um, use the indicator of uh, like within the 
metropolitan area, but outside the central city. So that was the specific um, kind of category that I used for suburban. And then of course, urban was within cities. And um, so, yeah, I, I did think some about the way that, you know, maybe smaller or smaller farm towns included in this, um, in this measure of, uh, uh, in this, I'm, I'm out of time. <laughs> <laughs> Have a measure of um, kind of metropolitan status. You know, what is the what exactly is happening in this category of within the metro area but outside the central cities? And there's no way in these data to really get into it. But um, I'm a bit concerned about it. But then there's also the the category of outside the metro area. So I feel like that's the more properly rural areas. Um, so that's kind of the way that I, I thought about that. And the first question, was, the first comment was uh, different patterns of migration to different right. places. Yeah, yeah. I, I mean, uh, so yeah, the West was the place where um, with the lowest percent of, of uh, Black veterans or Black people moving there. And then the Midwest and Northeast yeah, have the higher have the higher levels. So, but did you have a question about that? I guess I was just thinking about how that could possibly change like settlement patterns in terms of home ownership too. I'm not sure. I'm not, I was just thinking about how those, what those regions mean to kind of that, those broader patterns of migration and um, settlement basically. Okay, let's discuss. Yeah. Uh, yeah. All right, so on that note, I think we are going to stop the questions for now, but but let's discuss. So, uh, Dr. Abai is here this afternoon. So, if you have more more to talk to her about, please. Yeah, if you get back to me, I have a couple meetings left at 2:30, 3:30. We want to have some extra time. I also wanted to say tomorrow morning at 10, we're having coffee and good donuts and stuff up in the director's bay for the PSC for our monthly coffee chat. So you should all come. <laughs> Thank you for being here today. Thank you. And thanks for our Zoom.